Now, what I didn't tell you about these inertial frames is how they are related to each other. I just asserted that you can make one by this clock synchronization procedure, and then they will leave invariant this space-time interval, this delta s squared equals minus delta t squared plus delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta z squared. Then we want to know the class of transformations that preserves this form. That's a key question. So let me show you a really simple one, uh, time translation. So remember that this refers to two events, A and B. I've drawn here like they're space-like, but it doesn't matter exactly. Uh, there's a TA and an XA. Let's, let's not worry about Y and Z for now. There's a TB and an XB. And there's a delta T is TB minus TA. And the delta X is uh, XB minus XA, right? So time translation, little t goes to little t plus big T. Well, what happens? Well, TB shifts by big T, but so does TA, right? And so the difference delta T stays invariant. The capital T cancels out, all right? And this doesn't affect x, y, and z. So formally, if we sort of write this instead of a little arrow notation, if we instead introduce T prime, is equal to little t plus big T, then delta t prime equals delta t, and of course also delta x prime equals delta x, and delta y prime equals delta y, and delta z prime equals delta z, and so we can just use these formulas and discover that indeed we could also write delta t prime squared plus delta x prime squared plus delta y prime squared plus delta z prime squared, okay? So that is a very simple example, but it shows you exactly what I mean when I say preserve this form. So one answer was time translation. There's also space translation, so there's three of those, x, y, and z. Okay, now there's also rotations that change x, y, and z in more complicated ways, right? So a rotation, for example, uh, we could have, uh, well, let me not write it yet. Let's just say you know what rotations are. And then there's another one, which are the famous Lorentz boosts. And those have to do with change of velocity. That's why the inertial frame shows up, okay? So, but just as a matter of orientation, there are 10 continuous space-time symmetries. There's also reflections and so on, uh, but we're not going to get into those. We're going to talk about these 10 continuous symmetries, and that's the breakdown. They're the things that preserve this interval, and the collection of them is called the Poincaré group, and it plays a very important role in physics quite generally, and a bit of a motivating role in our study of general relativity. Okay, so I need to tell you really the big new one, the Lorentz boost, and I'm going to use this as an opportunity to introduce some very useful notation. So, here's one bit of new notation. Delta S squared is going to be equal to eta mu nu, delta X mu, delta X nu. X mu refers to the coordinates t, x, y, z. Okay, so t is just x upper 0, x is just x upper 1, y is x upper 2, and z is x upper 3. Now I know this looks like x squared and x cubed and so on, uh, I promise you'll never get confused. It's rare that we write the numbers out explicitly anyway, and context will always make clear what's meant. You might think we could fix this by just making the numbers subscripts, but we'd need superscripts for something else and there'd still be confusion. So the convention is on the coordinates, the index goes up, okay? Now the other convention here is there's an implicit sum 
over both mu equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and nu equals 0, 1, 2, 3. So the idea is any Greek index runs 0, 1, 2, 3. And whenever you have one upstairs and one downstairs index together of the same letter mu, for example, then it means sum. Okay, so repeated indices are summed, always. It's always going to be one up and one down. And we'll explain why later. But for now, just learn the notation. Okay? And before we had written out uh, this thing as delta t squared plus delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta z squared, if you compare the two, if you compare the two, you can see what I need, what I need to assign for this eta. This eta is kind of like a matrix. We're not going to think of it as a matrix, but I'm going to write it as a table of numbers. And the numbers are minus 1 in the 0, 0 component. Zeros here, 1, 0, 0. And then the rest is just a diagonal matrix of 1s. Okay. So this thing is called the metric. And this notation is really not overboard because it's going to generalize straight to curve space time where it's going to be essential. But that's our flat metric because special relativity is, as we will see, the study of so-called flat space times in a manner we will make precise. OK, so that's our new notation for the line element. You can check this is the same thing as delta t minus delta t squared from that minus sign plus delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta z squared. And now we want to talk about a transformation like a rotation. So let's introduce a rotation matrix. I'm going to do R upper mu, lower mu prime. I'll tell you why I'm going to do that later. But for now, let's just consider that a rotation matrix. So I really need this to be a 1 in the time. Time comes first in our ordering. So this bit will make it leave the time component alone. Then for a rotation say about the z-axis, it looks like this for some angle theta. And it leaves the z-axis alone, too, because that's the rotation axis. Okay? But that would also be t prime, x prime, y prime, z prime. Okay? Or every once in a while, you might write x0 prime, x1 prime, x2 prime, and x3 prime. Right? So that's our new coordinates. That's the, or the ones we're rotating from in this case. This matrix sort of goes from primed to unprimed. And then how do we apply the rotation matrix? Well, we multiply it by the, we'll think of this as a vector for now. I'm going to subtract that idea soon. But for now, we'll just say t, x, y, z is a vector. And you feed it into the rotation matrix. And you do it by matrix multiplication. And matrix multiplication in this notation is very nice. It's just summing the upstairs x in x mu prime index with the downstairs mu prime index of the rotation matrix. Okay. Now, if you don't need want to see the connection to matrix multiplication, you don't have to. Uh, we're going to use this index notation almost exclusively, but sometimes it's nice to see. Okay. But but from the fact that that is a matrix multiplication, and you already know this thing is a rotation matrix, that tells us that our x mu is related by this very nice formula. Okay? And so rotations are one example of a transformation that preserve the space-time interval because they preserve only the, they don't mess with time at all, and we all know they preserve distances, right? So that is, if you like, a demonstration. You could plug this rotation matrix in, calculate the space-time interval, and you'd find that delta s equals, so delta s squared equals delta s prime squared. You just plug it in and use trig identities and check. Okay? So that's the sense in which it preserves the space-time interval. If you use this formula to plug in, you'll just find that the two delta s's uh, are the same and in particular take you know the same form. You have to you have to define both of them. You know if delta s was defined as 
eta mu nu delta x mu delta x nu, then similarly for this to have content, you have to take delta s prime is the same thing, eta mu nu delta x mu prime delta x nu prime. And our convention is that we always keep the primes on the indices. So in order that I have one upstairs prime and one downstairs prime, I have to write eta mu prime nu prime. But it still represents the definite matrix minus one, 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 one on the diagonals. Okay, so this is a non-trivial calculation. It's non-trivial that rotations preserve the uh, invariant space-time element, but it's something you sort of already knew. All right, now that we have this notation, let me tell you about the Lorentz boost. So for the Lorentz boost, we're going to write it as lambda mu mu prime. And we're going to write lambda mu mu prime as a matrix that is kind of similar, but uh, it's going to be sort of like a rotation, but it's going to mix space and time, and it's going to be a kind of hyperbolic rotation. So there's going to be cos goes to cosh, and I'm going to call the effective angle thingy phi for now. I think I'm going to need more room here. So cosh phi, and then there's going to be cinch phi. And then there's going to be cinch phi, and then there's going to be cosh phi. And so I'm not going to uh, have a relative sign here. That's another feature of the um, hyperbolic rotation. And then I'll just have zeros, zeros, and it will leave the other coordinates invariant. Okay, so it's supposed to look kind of like a rotation except it involves one time and you've got some cautious and some cinches and so on, okay? So you can check similarly that if you take x mu equals lambda mu mu prime x mu prime, indeed you'll find the interval is preserved. Again, you write everything out and now you use some hyperbolic trig identities instead, but it still works, okay? So the claim is the only, mathematically, the only things that preserve this Interval are the translations, the rotations, and the boosts. So those are the things we're going to be very interested in for studying physics in these inertial frames. Of course, you might reasonably ask, you know, what is this boost, right? You want a physical interpretation, all right? So let's figure out the physical interpretation. Well, let's write out this formula more explicitly. So if we do this formula here and we look at mu equals zero, well, x zero is t, okay? And then we have lambda zero uh, mu prime, x mu prime. So I've just plugged in mu equals zero. Now remember, repeated indices are summed. So mu prime is gonna be summed over. So it's gonna be lambda zero, 0, x 0 prime, otherwise known as t prime, plus lambda 0, 1, x 1 prime, otherwise known as x prime, plus lambda 0, 2, y prime, plus lambda 0, 3, z prime. Okay, and now we look at our matrix, lambda over here, and we see that there's no 0, 2 element, there's no 0, 3 element, but there is a 0, 1 and a 0, 0. And those are cosh phi t prime plus cinch phi x prime. Okay, so that's t. And we could do the same thing for x. So for x, we're going to find it's lambda 1 mu prime x mu prime, and by the same thing, we're going to end up with lambda 1, 0, which is cinch phi times x prime, uh, t prime, rather, plus cosh phi times x prime, okay? And so there's a nice symmetry here. You've got cinches and cautions and, and so on, uh, multiplying different components. It still looks a little obscure. So let's think about it this way. Let's notice that the point x equals 0, point in space, is moving 
in the prime frame. Okay? This phi has to be a constant for this to work. So it's moving. So we just literally set x equals 0. And that tells us that cinch phi c prime plus cosh phi x prime is e well, that was x, so that's equal to 0, right? That's just from this equation here, set equal to 0. So we do that, and it shows us we could solve. We have x prime is equal to, I guess there's a minus the way I defined this. It's equal to minus cinch phi over cosh phi t prime. Remember, phi is a constant, right? So this thing here is just the constant velocity v between the frames. Now, I've, I've somehow picked the sign so that it's negative relative velocity. That's a sort of annoying sign thing. When you look up formulas for Lorentz transformations, you have to be very careful uh, with those conventions of normalization and so on. Uh, that's not really so important here. Um, for consistency, I'll keep the sign in there, so v equals uh, sin minus cinch uh, minus tanch phi. Okay, and let's just let's just talk about the norm of the velocity so that we don't have to worry about velocity of which frame relative to the other. We can just realize that the relative velocity of the frames is tanch phi. Okay, so now we know what it is. A Lorentz boost is changing the frame to one that's moving with constant relative velocity to the original. And this parameter phi that we introduced, well, it's tan hyperbolic tangent gives you the velocity. Now, this formula already has some interesting physics in it. We sort of built it in uh, by the way we constructed the theory, but it's nice to see it come out. And that is, let's think about this tanj function. What does tanj look like? Well, if you remember, it sort of goes to a constant value, negative 1 here, and then it comes up, and then it goes to another constant, plus 1. Right? Uh, so what's that telling us? It's saying no matter what real number we pick for phi, the velocity is going to be between minus 1 and 1. Uh, yeah, maybe I really ought to leave this as the... Uh, we can see that it can be positive or negative depending on the choice of phi. So let's just notice then that v, the relative velocity, is between minus 1 and 1. Okay. So what does that mean? It can't go faster than light. All right. So the Lorentz boost is a transformation that relates two inertial frames. I'll write that in word. Relates two inertial frames moving at constant subluminal, less than the speed of light, velocity relative to each other. So that's where the word boost comes from. Um, sometimes the word is used also for normal Galilean boosts in uh, pre-relativity physics. Um, and so the generalization that is the Lorentz boost. Okay, and we see right away that in the math, baked into the math, is that the frame transformation can't be going faster than light. You can't boost into the frame of something moving faster than light, which harmonizes with the idea that nothing can move faster than the speed. Now, this is probably not the most um, common form of the Lorentz boost, not necessarily the uh, one you've seen. So we can rewrite it in the most famous way by just eliminating v equals tanch phi. And, you know, let's try to do this. So let's look at 1 minus v squared. So that's 1 minus minus tanch phi squared, which is 1 minus tanch squared phi, tanch squared phi. And there's a trig identity that makes that 1 over cosh squared phi. And this is a symbol we actually um, like to do a lot. So we, we, there's a 
thing that people have defined, which is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared. That's the gamma factor, uh, or the boost factor. It's a convenient thing to talk about for particles moving very fast, because it's sort of hard to say. It's annoying to say, oh, it's this many percent of the speed of light. It's nice to say it has this gamma factor. So notice gamma is bigger than 1. As v approaches 1, the denominator uh, gets uh, smaller and smaller, and so gamma gets bigger and bigger. And as we've seen right here, it's actually just cosh of phi. And then to figure out sinh phi, we can use cosh squared phi minus sinh squared phi equals 1. And the fact that we just figured out that cosh squared phi is 1 over 1 minus v squared. And so if you work it through, this will tell us that sinh squared phi is v squared over 1 minus v squared. And then to fix the sign of sinh phi, since this only gives us its square, we'll have to look that, well, v was tanh phi, which is an odd function, has a minus sign in front, so it must be the same here. It must be minus v. Sinh phi must be proportional to tanh phi in sign, and so it will do minus v over 1 minus v squared with a square root, which is finally minus v gamma. Okay? So now we have our expression for cosh phi, we have our expression for sinh phi. We can plug into our Lorentz transformation, which up here you can see we had t is cosh phi t prime, x is sinh phi t prime plus cosh phi x prime. So cosh is gamma, sinh is v gamma, and so maybe up here I'll just write it in. We have gamma t prime, sinh was minus v gamma, minus v gamma x prime, and down here we have gamma, uh, sorry, we have minus v gamma t prime plus gamma x prime, so let me collect things together. Up here, we can write t equals gamma t prime minus v x prime, and we can write x equals gamma x prime minus v t prime, and maybe we'll include y equals y prime and z equals z prime. I didn't write them, but our matrix makes that clear. And so what we have here is the famous formula for a Lorentz transformation. And when you use formulas like this, you have to make, carefully make sure you interpret v correctly. So in this case, we found v was the velocity of the point x equals 0, so the velocity of the origin of the unprimed frame. So v is the velocity of unprimed frame uh, relative to or in the primed frame. All right, the last thing we want to do before we dive into vectors and tensors and all that is to get a geometric interpretation of the Lorentz transformation. And this is very important because you're going to do calculations, but you also have to learn how to draw pictures and interpret them, or you're going to have a really hard time making sense of the physics. Okay, just trust me. Everybody who works in this field draws lots of pictures. All right. So we're going to get our Lorentz transformation back, and I think I'm going to just reverse the prime and the unprimed from what I derived a minute ago, just because the, it's more, convention to, more conventional to think of it as t prime equals gamma t minus vx, and x prime equals gamma x minus vt. And so recall then that gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared, and v is between minus 1 and 1, okay? So what we want to do is make a nice picture of this. Now, it's actually helpful to first do the same thing for rotations, all right? So let's consider plane geometry and just 2D plane geometry for simplicity. And let's consider the rotation, all right? So that was, if we had x and y, that would be x prime is equal to sine, or the x prime is equal to cos theta x 
minus sine theta y and y prime would be equal to sine theta x plus cos theta y. So let's label those. So this will be the y unprimed axis and this will be the x unprimed axis. And now let's figure out what the primed axes look like. So let's think about an x prime axis. So an x axis was an axis where y is constant, right? So x prime axis is where y prime is constant. So it can be a little confusing because the definition of one axis involves the other variable quite crucially, right? Uh, so the x prime axis is where y prime is constant. So that tells us if y prime is a constant, usually we take it to be zero, right, for the axis. So let's just do that, y prime equals zero. So that's sine theta x equals minus cosine theta y or y over x, the rise over the run, y over x is equal to minus sine theta over cosine theta. So if theta is a small number, uh, this is going to be negative. And so it looks to me like it's going to have negative slope. So this is going to be a rotation downwards by an angle theta. And so we'll write this for our x prime axis, if that's theta. And then you can do the same exercise. And the nice property of rotations is it keeps the axes orthogonal like that. And so we'll have this is our x prime axis, and this is our y prime. So we could consider some point A on the plane, and we could assign it x and y coordinates. And visually, the way we do it is we draw a line straight down. We see where it hits the x-axis, and we call that point its x-coordinate. Whatever tick mark we wrote on the x-axis, uh, that tick mark, you know, the numerical value we assign to it is the x-a coordinate. And likewise, we go straight left, and we get y-a. OK, but we could also do this relative to the primed axes, right? And now you can either tilt your head on the side to think about it, or you can just remember I'm supposed to draw a line that's parallel to the y prime axis in order to get it the x prime component. So it would be a line something like this. And let's make that a dotted line. So that's our dotted line down to uh, make a right angle there. And then we'd call whatever tick mark we hit to on the x prime axis, we'd call that uh, x prime a. And likewise, we need a line parallel to the x axis. And we need to see where we meet the y prime axis in order to get the y prime component. And then we have this lovely property that, in fact, x squared plus y squared is equal to x prime squared plus y prime squared for that event. That's the invariance of length in the 2D plane. Okay? So what we want to do is get the analogous picture in the space-time case for a Lorentz boost. So let's go ahead and try to do that. So we're going to need a very similar diagram, except now it's time going up. And the convention is just that we draw our unprimed axes at right angles on the page. That's just a convention. But let's stick to it, so t and x. And now we need to do the same exercise to figure out the axes. So let's start again with the x prime axis. So again, the x prime axis, well, that's just the point where the other coordinate is 0, right? So again, it crucially involves the other coordinate. That's just the point t prime equals 0, the line t prime equals 0. But to represent that on the diagram, we're going to have to use the formula. So right here, we see that uh, t prime is equal to gamma t minus vx. 
So if t prime is 0, that says t minus vx equals 0, or t equals vx. So that's a line through the origin with slope v. So let's go ahead and draw that. So our primed coordinate system, the x prime axis, actually looks something like this. Okay, so far so good. Now you might think that the t prime axis ought to be orthogonal on the plane when we represent it, but it isn't. t prime axis, well that's the point where, that's the line where x prime equals zero. So we do the same thing. That's the same, x prime equals zero is the same as x equals vt, or t equals one over v times x. So now it's a line through the origin of slope 1 over v, all right? It's going to be a tall line. So it's going to look like this. Okay, it's going to kind of symmetrically squeeze towards the middle. And that's our t prime axis, okay? Oh, I did the colors wrong. So the colors are fixed now. And so you see the red lines kind of squish symmetrically towards the middle. And in the limit that V went to 1, where the boost went to the speed of light, they would end up coming exactly towards the 45 degree line, which is the light. Okay, but it's just a pictorial representation. We could just as well say that the original frame was super boosted relative to the primed frame, all right? Just the convention is we start with orthogonal axes for t and x, orthogonal on the plane of the page when we draw the diagram. And we can play the same game. We, we can talk about some event A, and we can resolve it in the same way um, here. So this is whatever tick mark units we're using there. That's x, a, and then whatever units Every units we're using here, that's TA. And now how do we find in this diagram the prime components? Well, you can't just turn your head on the side anymore because this is not just a rotated version, it's a kind of squished version on the page. So we have to think about how it works, and the rule is you draw a line parallel to the T prime axis, and you see where you hit the X prime axis, so it's going to look something like that. It's going to look something like that. And that, where it hits, is going to be our x prime a. And then we're also going to draw a line parallel to the x prime axis to see where we hit the t prime axis. And that line, wherever that hits the t prime axis, that line is going to give us our t prime a. And then again, from the formulas, we will have that minus t squared plus x squared equals minus t prime squared plus x prime squared, the invariance of the Lorentzian space-time interval as opposed to the invariance of the Euclidean distance. Okay, so this is just a super useful diagram, and there's going to be homework problems where you work through special relativity problems, and I'm just, I'm going to ask you to draw this diagram, and you're going to have to sit through it and think about it and make sense of it, but it's a great way to keep track of the idea that two different frames can have two different interpretations in terms of what they call space and time by their own procedures of synchronizing these clocks in their own rooms or spaceships or whatever, and you can put two on the same page by remembering that it looks like this. And let me just finish off by giving one sort of graphical proof of something quite interesting that I asserted before. So if we again do our um, space-time diagram here with the convention that some frame unprimed is vertical, Notice that in our boosted frames, the uh, 
lines like this, so this one, this line here was what we called uh, t prime equals zero, otherwise known as the x prime axis, right? But we could draw also a line for, you know, t prime equals one second or whatever, and another one, right? So we could imagine sort of foliating this plane by these constant t prime surfaces, right? Which are just as a good notion of constant time as the constant t surfaces, right? The constant t surfaces are like this. Remember in the very beginning of this lecture, we talked about how Newtonian space-time can be foliated by these constant time planes. And then I said, in relativity, we don't have that anymore. We just have light cones. Well, now I've introduced a new idea, inertial frames. And the special class of inertial frames defines special slicings that look kind of Newtonian, but different inertial frames have different slicings, and you can put them on one diagram in this way. And the nice thing about doing this is you can see, for example, if I make two events, so let's make an event here and an event here, okay? So there's two events, so this is event A and this is event B. Now they're space-like separated. I've drawn them at more horizontal than vertical. But here's the interesting thing. According to black, according to T, A is before, in quotes, because remember we don't like to ascribe causal significance to space-like separated events, but if we just insist that we reckon things according to this unprimed inertial frame, A is before B, right? It's lower down, okay? But according to red, think about it. B is occurring in this time band, which is before this later time band, right? So in fact, according to red, according to T prime, A is after. Okay? And so that's why we say there's no point in discussing uh, simultaneity or before and after or any sort of causal or any sort of relationship between A and B. Different classes, reasonable classes of observers will actually argue over which one happened first. Okay? So this is one of the most vivid um, demonstrations of the total destruction of this Newtonian notion of universal time, which is really quite central to special relativity and by extension to general relativity as well.